And a good morning to you. Take your hymn book today. Find, if you would, page 43 on the very first Sunday of the new year. What a great hymn to begin declaring the power of the name of Jesus. Let's stand, lift your voice. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Page 43, do your best now. Father, we thank you so much for this morning, Lord. Thank you that indeed we can hail the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for loving us in such a great way that you are willing to send him to die on that cross. And thank you, Lord, that we can gather today and celebrate the fact that we know that we know that we have a personal relationship with you, not because of belief, not because of tradition, not because of church or even baptism, but because of the work of redemption of Christ on the cross and a simple reception of that gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ and believing by faith in him. Lord, we love you for such a wonderful gift. We love you for loving us in such a great way for you first loved us. And Father, may we receive that lesson today. And Lord, I pray from the bottom of my heart that if today there is someone here that is not has not put their personal trust in you and you alone, Father, that today would be the day of salvation. Father, that we may rejoice in starting the new year with the fact that we can establish that truth for eternity today, once and for all. Lord, thank you so much for blessing us and being with us in this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn around and greet those around you. Love to watch you greet one another. You may be seated. For 30 years, I have known the two folks standing beside, behind me. 
The McCluskeys met them in northern Michigan when I was 12 or 13 years old, singing in my dad's church. Now here they are singing at Plantation Baptist, still singing the same gospel truth in the music. And I love their music because I can understand their words about my favorite subjects, praising the Lord, grace, salvation, the cross, and the blood. They're going to be with us all day today. I trust you'll be blessed as they lead us to praise the Lord together. Would you welcome, please, the McCluskeys. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. Amen. Aren't you glad we can worship and praise the Lord? Let every creature join and praise the Almighty God. The trees of the field clap their hands and sound it abroad.
like seeing this. If you're a believer, wave at me like that. Oh, yeah, that's an awesome picture, amen? Here's a verse, listen to this. It's the wise men and the angels, blind Bartimaeus, feet and a trainer's keys. Walk on the water, Jairus' daughter, five loaves and part right here. A Sunday morning and the stone rolled away. And I believe every line, every word. I believe every story I've heard. Written on the pages is the truth of the ages. And it's changing me. And if you believe every word written on the page, say amen. amen. What, a, what a joy. Thank you so much. So good to see you, church family. You've been gone traveling the world over the holidays. And uh, some of you have been outside the United States. Some of you have been up in the north. How many saw snow between Christmas and New Year's? You actually were in snow. And how many of you actually enjoyed it? Okay, a few of you. I grew up in northern Michigan. When I was a young man, we averaged over 200 inches of snow a season. I remember as a little boy, when they would plow our driveway, I'd have to stand on the couch to see out the top of the sliding doors. I remember my dad tying a rope from our front door to our mailbox so we could find the mailbox during the winter. I remember something called black ice. Anybody ever hit black ice? Got a great story about be sure your sin will find you out when it comes to black ice. My brother tried to get away with something one time when he was about 16 years of age, and he had it all planned out, driving where he was going, one where he was supposed to be, thought he was going to get away from it, got 100 yards from where he shouldn't have been, and hit black ice and flipped that car over and over and over and over again. And God spared his life so my dad could almost end his life on that day. <laughs> I remember coming upstairs from my room a couple times and there were strangers sleeping in our living room because they got trapped overnight and had to spend the night. I'll never forget when I was offered a job in college to come to South Florida and be a youth pastor. I can honestly say I didn't even pray about it. I just said, okay, God, <laughs> South Florida, here we come, man. And uh, 20 some years later, I'm glad to be where it's warm. And if you're visiting with us, you've come to a place that loves the Lord, and we love the Word of God, we love people, and we're excited to have you. In the pew in front of you is a connection card, if you'd be so kind as to reach out, grab that card, fill it out, put it in your offering plate when it goes by. We've had so many guests throughout the holiday season, and of course with the Christmas lights, and so on, what a joy it has been to read those and to just see how 
how God is working in people's lives and bringing them to Plantation Baptist Church. While they're doing that, a couple of announcements. Don't forget our service tonight at 6 o'clock. Um, the McCluskeys will be with us. They'll have the entire service of music and challenge and just lifting our spirits. They have a table in the back, by the way, that they've got CDs and things available for you. If you love good Christian music, you want to get one of those and put it in your car or put it in your system there. But um, I love their music because, like I said, you can understand it, and it's about the subjects that we love when it comes to the person of the Lord Jesus. I promise you, if you play their music in your car, you'll you'll be blessed. You'll find yourself singing along. I find myself speeding along as I'm singing along, and so I have to slow myself down. Um, Wednesday night, back to normal, except the bulletin says there's Wednesday night meals. They don't start till next Wednesday, but we have Awana. We have Bible study. We'll be in the book of Deuteronomy. And be going forward there, men. We have a men's breakfast Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. Don't cost you anything. Love to see you there. A time of refreshment and encouragement and fellowship with other men. Bring a guest that lasts about an hour. You'll be glad that you were there. We always leave there blessed and encouraged to go on as brothers and to serve the Lord. It's a wonderful, sweet-spirited time. The food is usually pretty good. And so uh, if nothing else, you come and get refreshed there. If you're going to Israel with me at the end of the month, at the end of the month, we've got about 25 folks that are going. We have a meeting next Sunday night. I have all of the details uh, about the trip that you will need to know, and we'll go over all of that. And if you cannot make that meeting, please see me. I'm getting the number one question. Pastor, is it still safe to go to Israel? So here's my que- here's how I'm answering that. Go home tonight at 10 o'clock. Turn your television to channel 7, WSVN, and see if it's safe to walk out your front door. Amen? I mean, wherever we go, we got to go with the protection of the Lord. I told the church Wednesday night, you left here a week ago. You left here a week ago on, on New Year's Eve day, and I said, whatever you do, be safe. I said, don't be out late. It's dangerous out there. Uh, we woke up Sunday morning. Simeon Dunstan had taken the church van to his house overnight. Woke up the next day, walked outside, noticed the window had been shattered and a bullet sitting right on the dashboard of that truck. And so God protected that from even going through their home. And so praise God for his protective mercy. Amen. It's funny. The police officer said that morning that Simeon made the 85th call that they had after New Year's Eve night. So um, we live in a dangerous world, but praise the Lord, we know the great shepherd and he watches over us. What a blessing. I chose hymn number 572 because of the preparation of our heart, because of the message it is uh, and the story of our lives as we look into 2018. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a reason to praise our Savior all the day long. Let's stand. Lift your voice now. Do your best here. 572. Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rest on my side angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy whispers of love this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song in my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. 
I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Pray with me at this time. We'll have our prayers to the people, then our offering. If you're our guest, please, if you put that card in the plate, that sure would bless us. Pray with me, please, if you would. Heavenly Father, God, oh, that this is our story. This is our song. To praise our Savior all the day long. What a great, great hymn to sing on the first Sunday of the year. I pray, God, that we would be found faithful to rejoice in the Lord always. I pray that we would be found faithful to be in everything to give thanks according to the will of God. God, I pray that everything, everyone that has breath would praise the Lord this year. We preached last week as we'd be grateful for 2017 and hopeful going into 2018. And I pray as we've transitioned this week, it's been just a wonderful time. I was so blessed by the dear lady in the first service who just said, what a delight she has had spending the time with the Lord in the beginning of the new year. And what a joy. God, I, I thank you for the assurance of Jesus in our life. I thank you for salvation. I thank you, God, that once we know him and received him, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Oh, what a blessing that is. I pray today, God, for our service. I thank you for the sweet spirit that is in this place. Thank you already how the music has lifted and encouraged us and brought the joy of the Lord to us, which is our strength. Now this preacher asks you to, Bless him and help me to preach. Spirit of God, fill me. Lord, you know the message that's on my heart, and I want you to communicate it, God. I believe it comes from your heart, and I want it to touch the heart of everyone in the room. Oh, what a mighty God you are, our great God and our great Savior, and we love you. Oh, how we love you. I pray if there be anybody here today that's not saved, that today, God, today, they would humble their heart and open their heart and believe upon you by faith, receiving the Lord as their great Savior. Lift the righteous now. God, I pray, I pray that you know the gratitude and the love of your people, for you truly are an amazing God. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your great love for us. For it's in Jesus' name now we make this prayer. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated as we continue our time of worship. By the bringing the tithe and the giving the offering, if you're our guest, if you put that card in the plate, listen to our offertory on grace. It's all about grace and his sweet tender mercy reaching down from heaven on the darkest of days to a cross where a son would give his life for even me 
I was found, but now I'm free. Condemned, but now I'm righteous. That is how the Lord sees me. And because I've been redeemed, I will look upon his face and sing through all the ages. It was God. It's all about grace and his sweet tender mercy reaching down from heaven on the darkest of days to a cross where a son would give his life for even me as it was. about grace for by grace are ye saved through faith that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast our scripture this morning is the sixth chapter of the book of Romans the sixth chapter of the book of Romans pastor the book of Romans is not the book of Revelation we'll begin to pick back up the book of Revelation next week Lord willing but God has laid a New Year's message on my heart this morning So fitting is the song that they just sung as introduction to the message for the sixth chapter. The book of Romans follows some of the greatest verses in the Bible from that fifth chapter. I think about chapter 5, verse number 20, where it says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. If you know the Lord... And you know the word of God, oh, you know the value of grace, amazing grace, the great grace of God. Chapter number six, Paul begins to expand on what grace can do in your life. Look, if you would, at verse number one. The apostle Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. He's talking about the redemption of Christ. He's talking about the transformation of life that Christ is. 
He's talking about the washing that the Lord Jesus does in our lives by his blood, the grace of God, and how the grace of God changes our life. If you look at verse number six of this chapter, you see the very first word is the word knowing. You ought to circle that word. If you come to verse number 11, you see there's a word in there that starts with an R. It's the word reckon. You ought to circle the word reckon. You get to verse number 13, you ought to circle the word yield. No, reckon, and yield. This is, has nothing to do with my message at all. This is all extra for you. You did not pay for this. This is my gift to you as extra message this morning. No, reckon, and yield. All oh, the responsibility of God's child to understand how grace works in our life. <clears throat> I, um, I'm excited for 2018 as the pastor. I'm excited for our church for 2018. I, I believe that God's going to give us uh, a good year. I'm not promising you a simple year or an easy year, but I understand from the Word of God that we are promised God's faithful presence in our life. I preached to you last week on the great shepherd and how that the Lord Jesus is my shepherd. He's your shepherd as well if you have been saved and you know him in your heart. And we were able to look back in 2006, 17 and see how faithful the shepherd was to lead and to guide our lives and how he loved us and cared for us. I wanted that message not only to make you grateful, but I wanted it to make you hopeful as you come into 2018, knowing that you can trust the Lord Jesus in your life. You can trust his leadership, his working in your life. Oh, the shepherd loves the sheep. And so I trust that that message has encouraged you and you're still feeding off of that message. On Wednesday night, I preached a message entitled The Danger of a Defeated Mind. If you did not, weren't here Wednesday night, I beg you to listen to Wednesday night message. It, it's going to lead you in the biblical mindset to know victory in 2018. So many Christians are already defeated in their mind when it comes to 2018. And it, it's, that defeat has positioned them into a negativity or positioned them into some type of loss or sorrow. And there is a tremendous danger of having a defeated mind. Mind. And Nehemiah talked about the mind of the people being set to know victory. If you have not listened or got that message, I would encourage you. When you lump those two messages together, you will understand why I'm preaching the message that I am preaching today. I, God has kind of laid a vision on my heart for our church in 2018. And he took the verse in Timothy, and I won't have you turn there. I'm just going to read it to you. He took this verse. Paul's writing to the young preacher boy here, and he says this, <clears throat> If I tarry long, thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The house of God is to be the pillar and ground of truth. Paul here is alluding that the church is called the house of God. And the church is to be a place where the truth knows a pillar and the truth knows a ground. This is so important to me because over the last 30 days and over the last five years, God has really transformed Plantation Baptist Church. What I mean by transformed Plantation Baptist Church is Really and truthfully, we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into when one day Joey and I thought it was a good idea to put Christmas lights on the property. We never knew the attraction that that would have to a lost world looking for light. In the last 30 days, we have put tens of thousands of people through the property as they looked at the Christmas lights. And it's been our prayer that as they have looked at the Christmas lights, that in seeing those lights, they would see the light of the world, and his name is Jesus Christ. I would love to give you just a little example. I hope I don't fall flat on my face with this example, but how many were first introduced to our church, whether you've been here 10 years or 10 minutes, were introduced to our church through the Christmas lights? Could you raise your hand? 
Okay, scattered all throughout here are folks that were through the Christmas lights. When you multiply what has happened in the last 30 days over the last five years, if you're talking about an average of 30,000 people in 30 days that have come to our lights, that means that we have had 150,000 people come through our lights in five years. 150,000 people. Think about that. Hardly can you go anywhere in the city and not run into somebody who has been to our Christmas lights. Have you run into somebody that's been to the Christmas lights in the city before? Yes, absolutely. I was in a federal courthouse getting ready to sit on a federal jury, and they're talking about our Christmas lights inside that federal jury. I was there as a juror. (laughs) I was watching ESPN back when... Before we got stupid Hallmark, I used to be able to watch ESPN. (laughs) They used our our lights for a commercial. It was kind of hard on me a little bit to to be here when the lights were on because I'm used to gathering with our church people. And when we gather with our church people, there's a certain decorum about coming to church. There's a certain reverence about being on the property. There's a love for the Lord. When you invite the lost community to the property, they're lost people. And so sometimes they showed up stoned out of their mind. And sometimes they would walk through and they had their beer and they had their, you could smell marijuana. I I asked Joey, I said, Joey, are you doing something I don't know about over here? (laughs) And I heard things that I, you know, I just, you know, when when you love the Lord, you don't ever want anything to hurt the Lord, Right? But, but lost people are lost people, and they, they don't know. They need to know the Lord. And so they would come on the property, and, and I didn't dare tell them I was the pastor. Somebody asked me, do you work here? I said, talk to that guy right over there. <laughs> I was incognito, baby, just standing there. And, you know, it was hard just to kind of see that. But then I remember, but by the grace of God, that was me, right? And I was that, but I've been washed. And so... Here's how how I feel, church. I I feel like God has done a remarkable job as using our church as a lighthouse for the gospel in our community. And even though our property is tucked away back here, and I mean, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a million times. There's a church back there? You would be amazed at how many people that are sitting out here, when they first tried to find our church, got to the stop sign and cursed God and died and turned around, right? You know, they didn't even know to come all the way down. There's a, and then people say, you should sell that property and you should move out on the main road. Let me tell you something. God's on this property. We ain't selling this property, baby. It's beautiful property. A little muddy, but it's beautiful, okay? But I think God has done a wonderful job using us as a light. We're not the only church. There are other churches, believe me. But I do believe now that God is impressing upon me about us being the pillar and ground of truth. I believe this. I believe every word written on every page. If you believe, say amen. Amen. And I do believe that the world is looking for truth. You might be here today for the very first time, and I'm going to talk with you just in a moment. I think people know when they hear truth, and they know when they don't hear truth. The Bible talks about how how truth rings, and it it, it carries with it a a power and a freedom. And and you know when you've heard the truth, whether you like it or not, and you you know when you have not. And And I do believe that not just our church, But all churches in our community ought to feel the burden and the responsibility from the word of God to be a church that has the pillar and ground of truth. And the truth is not Tom's truth. And the truth is not some kind of Baptist truth. The truth is the word of God. The Bible says that it is the truth. And so I really feel a responsibility for to stand upon that word, to preach the word, to be consistent, to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort, to preach the whole counsel of God. And, and, and people can say a whole lot of things about our church, but the number one thing I want them to say is, those folks believe the Bible. Amen? Speaking of 
Joey. The reason I'm preaching the message today is because I, I remember his story. And it, I never forgot five years ago the deal that Joey Callahan made with his family. Joey was not a believer when we first met him. By the way, Joey's the one responsible to put all the lights up here. He works on our staff. He's in Orlando today on some vacation. But Joey was not a believer when I first met him. He was my neighbor. And I'm going to tell you right now, he wasn't very Christian. (laughs) But he was a good guy. God began a relationship with us. And I, I met his wife first in Publix. And she got saved. His two daughters later, and they got saved. And Joey was the type of guy that he believed if he came to church, the building would fall down. You would be amazed how many grown men believe that if they come in this building, it's going to fall down. I tell them, listen, there's so many wicked men here already, it should have fallen down already before, (laughs) including me, man. I'll never forget, he he had made a deal with his family. Here was the deal. They had invited him to church in the fall, and he said, um, to try to get out of this, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, the first Sunday of January, I'll come to church. And and he was hoping his family would forget about that, but they never forgot about that. And so making a deal, being a man of his word, the very first Sunday of January, Joey comes to church. Oh, I was so excited. I was looking for him. I knew he would be here. And I stand back there and I shake hands after 11 o'clock service. And so he went to shake my hand. And I, I, I did a Malcolm handshake to him. I grabbed him and I looked him right in the eyeball and I said, it's still standing. He kind of went like this, you know, a little bit. And I said, you know what? It'll be standing next week, and it'll be standing the week after. Lo and behold, he kept coming to church. And he came in January, Easter Sunday. Jared Powell, where you're sitting, I do believe, is where Joey was sitting. And I preached a message that day, and the gospel got a hold of his heart. And in that balcony, he prayed to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. You think about how, you think about this now. A man that didn't know God comes to church, gets saved. God changes his life. God gives the man a vision. And now five years later, hundreds of thousands of people have been introduced to the light of the world. To God be the glory. So I'm wondering who my Joeys are out here today. I'm wondering if you're here today and you made some kind of deal with yourself, you made some kind of deal with your family, you made some kind of deal that the very first Sunday of January, you were going to try something different. There's a big old hole in the middle of your gut that just has not been satisfied by all your money, by all the prestige, by all the accomplishments, by all that you can do to try to do it. There's a hole in there, and you know it. God knows it. You wouldn't really want anybody else to know it, but you're here today on the very first Sunday of the year, and you're just looking for something to mean something to you. Well, I got news for you. The something you're looking for is the someone, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so I want to be as simple as I can. You want complexity? You come back next week. We're with the church at Tyra Tyra. It's so complex, and I'm losing hair by the day. But I want to preach to you Romans chapter 6, verse number 23. I want to preach this simple verse because I do believe that the truth of this one verse, the truths of this one verse are so timeless. And I really do believe that if you're going to have a spiritual life and you're going to understand spiritual direction, you've got to understand the truths of Romans chapter 6, verse number 23. And I would beg you, if you would, please, to read that verse out loud with me. Okay? Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Here we go. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you know that verse in your heart, would you say amen? Amen. What a, what a powerful, precious verse this is. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I submit to you, every successful spiritual journey begins here. I submit to you that every person that's ever been looking for truth has found a platform of truth on this verse. I submit to you if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm giving him one chance, one chance. He's got one opportunity to make a difference in my life. 
I use that verbiage because I walked into church today and one of our dear members said, Pastor, my niece's husband killed themselves. I came to church a couple of weeks ago and a lady that's been coming to our church for many weeks tried twice. Tried twice to end her life. I found that from Thanksgiving to the end of the new year, people suffer so much in their mind in these days. And they, 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 don't, they don't know how to guard their mind with the word of God. And it seems like feelings can just run amok. I asked the one lady, I said, ma'am, why did you try to hurt yourself like that? And she said, well, man, Pastor, when I come to church, I look around and everybody has the perfect life. <laughs> You've been to my church? You've been to my church, right? Yeah, I've been to your church. Pastor, everybody looks so happy. Everybody looks like they got it on control. And she said, I, 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 I'm just not happy and I don't have it under control and I, I just... I just can't t take it, and I just I couldn't rationalize that. Let, let me speak to that heart and that mind. I'm not talking about this lady. I'm talking about the whoever's here. This church is not filled with people who do not have problems. Everybody has problems. What you're seeing is something called the joy of the Lord. And when the Lord Jesus lives inside of you, baby, he brings his life more abundantly, and just like the songwriter wrote, life is worth the living because he lives. And so I, I, I think understanding the depth of this little verse here will help you just transition. Whether you're a non-believer or you've been a Christian for a long time, I think the truths will bless you. Immediately, thoughts jump, jump out at me. In your bulletin, I have them outlined there. You might follow along there as you want to. I see the words life and death. I see how that is a familiar part of our world. We understand life and we understand death. We understand that death is part of life. We understand that once you are created, once your life begins, we understand that there will be an end to your physical life. And I think that one of the first truths that you need to understand from this verse is this. Life is short. Life is is short. I need you to know that. I need you to understand that. I, you must understand that in your heart and your mind. The Bible says that life is like a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then it vanisheth away. The older I get, the more it seems like life speeds up. I don't know if any of you others feel that way. Some of you are old enough. You're like on the super highway. I mean, you're, you're almost Star Wars opportunity here, you know, hyperspeed. Um, I, I guess I'm reaching a stage in my life. I'm in the mid-40s where you begin to think differently. You begin to look at life differently. Um, and I'm, I'm beginning to realize that I'm not a kid anymore. Not a kidding. My dad and I, whenever I have outside gardening work to do, I call my dad or I call my mother in law. Why? Because they're both from northern Michigan and they had farms and they garden and all that and they miss it real bad. So I give them the opportunity to enjoy that, to be a blessing and to help. So I said, Beverly, you call your mother, I'll call my dad. I said, hey, dad, you want to come? Oh, I would love to do something. Come on down, come on down. So call your mom. She can plant flowers and do fine. And so brought him down, and dad and I were out in the yard, and we were doing some work. And I don't know if you saw the sunset Saturday night. That thing was beautiful. The sky was just colorful as could be. And I stepped back with my dad, and I said, man, dad, that reminds me of Michigan. And my dad said, oh, it does. And I, re I just got like a little glimpse in my mind about my youth. And it was kind of a cooler evening out there. And in Michigan, in July, the days would be warm. But at night, you'd have to wear a coat. And the sky would be and it were beautiful and reminded me of working outside. And I thought, you know, I don't have those days anymore. I won't have those days anymore. I told my dad because my dad said he missed it. I said, well, maybe one day we'll get back up there to see those, those skies. And life just seems to be be clicking along. Pastor, are you trying to discourage me? No, I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to encourage you. Here's what I want you to understand. The fact that life is short also brings a tremendous value to your life. 
And I want you, as you sit here this morning, to to know the value of your life. I want you to believe that your life is worth something. Amazes me how many people don't think they're, they're, think that their life is not worth anything, and the very fact that life is short and that life is like a vapor that appears here for a little time, it, it, it brings tremendous value. Let me tell you how valuable Jesus thinks about your life. Here's what he said. He said this: If a man could gain the whole world but lose his own soul, what profited him? Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said this, your life is worth more than all that the world has to offer. Pastor, my my life doesn't carry that kind of value. Pastor, I I don't have joy in my life. There's difficulties in my life. If my life was so valuable, how come I have cancer? If my life is so valuable, how come I'm suffering? If my life is so valuable, pastor, then how come my circumstances aren't what they should be? If you're telling me my life is valuable, then why do I feel like I feel? Good questions. Nothing wrong to have good questions. I face good questions all the time. Let me be the first one to tell you that even the pastor doesn't have all the answers. But God has all the answers. I can't tell you why your life is difficult other than it's went through the heart and mind of God and God said about your life that it happens for two reasons, for your good and for God's glory. It's times like these that I think about the Bible. I think about the truth that the Bible is. I think about the grace of God. You know, there are some times I don't have any answer other than God's grace will be sufficient. And by the way, his grace is sufficient. Amazes me. How people don't value their life the way the Lord values their life. We had a little conversation last night in our family between the kids and Beverly and I. And somehow we got on this conversation about which kid is like which parent. If you've never done that, let me give you a little advice. Don't do it. (laughs) Why? Because the dad and the mom end up fighting pretty good, okay? So... So we were talking about this, and somebody said something about standing up in front of people. And I told the kids, I said, listen, if you'd have known me when I was younger, I hated standing up in front of people. I was a very shy person, and all of them blurted out laughing. When I I grew up, I had some tremendous insecurities in my physical appearance. Um, You ever heard of a person having a complex? I kind of was close to that. I remember when I would go to school, the kids would sit behind me, in front of me, and I always sat on the edge of my chair, and I always leaned forward because I had some physical things that I didn't like about myself. And I remember that I, I didn't like a lot of um, facial recognition. You know, kids can be cruel, can't they? I, I, I got, they didn't call it bullying back then, but they sure didn't say nice things. And... You know, when you grow and you get older and you get into some mature mindset, you kind of learn how to live with yourself. By the way, let me just say this. God doesn't make junk. Right? So I had to get past that. Well, my kids are growing up just like your kids are growing up. And kids are still ruthless and kids are still cruel. And and sometimes they, they take on themselves certain things. So here's what I've been having to tell my kids. I say, kids, listen. When you look into the mirror sometimes and you see yourself, you see what nobody else sees. I don't want my kids to have a complex. I don't want my kids to have disorders. I don't want my kids to think less of themselves. I want my kids to realize that God made them. And so I tell them, you look in the mirror and you see things nobody else sees. We see beauty. We see, uh, Tommy didn't want to be beauty, but we see handsome. And we we see these kind of things. And you're screaming about these little, little details here. Nobody but you sees them. And I found that's the same way about life. Sometimes you look at your life and all you see are the little imperfections of your life. And you think to the whole world, you're ugly. When I got news for you. The whole world may be ruthless, and the whole world may may be those kind of things, but 
But sometimes you and you alone are seeing things that nobody else is seeing. And when it comes to God, he sees you perfectly and he loves you no matter what. Amen? Amen. Can I tell you why your life is valuable? Two reasons. This verse teaches us this. Number one, because God created you. You see, if you believe in evolution, there's no value to, to, to how you came. You just, you just evolved. You just came apart. You just came into the world. But really and truthfully, the Bible says that God formed you inside your mother's womb. The psalmist said that he worked your veins and he, he worked on you. You were made by God. If you're ever going to know joy, love, peace, purpose, direction, satisfaction, accomplishment, if you're ever going to feel worth anything, you must believe that God created you. The people who don't understand that God created them, they have no mooring to their life. But God fashioned you. Not only are you valuable because God created you, but you're also valuable because you're eternal. You're eternal. You must believe this. When God made you, God made a temporal part to you, but God made an eternal part to you. And the Bible says here, and to have some spiritual understanding, if you're looking for truth, for the wages of sin is death. There will be a day that because of sin in our lives, we will go through the portal of physical death. But the gift of God is eternal what class? Life. There was a day when you did not exist. But from the time you were conceived, for all eternity, you will exist. You are valuable because you're not just some evolution for this life that gets annihilated. You've been created by God and you will be created for all eternity. Eternity. Do you understand what eternity is? No end. Many, many writers have tried to define eternity, and they'll take something like, I've, I've heard all kinds of illustrations, There's nothing wrong with these little illustrations, about a bird that would come to the Atlantic Ocean and, and take with his beak one pebble of water and fly from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean and deposit that into the Pacific Ocean until the little bird emptied out the Atlantic Ocean into the Pacific Ocean. And then the Atlantic Ocean, the little bird would go over here to the Pacific and take it all and put it back. And they said, when the little bird was done with that, eternity is just beginning. Eternity is a long time. It's forever. Why would you tell us that, Pastor? Because you need to understand something. You were created by God. Your life is so valuable. It's so valuable in the fact that it's so short. But also, you are eternal, which means that there's a part of you that will never, ever end. And what you, what you do in this life really has a lot to do with eternity. And the person who's solely uh, concentrated on all that this life has to offer and never thinks about eternity, that's the person that is empty. I gotta say that again. That was so good. God just gave it to me. I mean, I didn't even say that in the first service. Pastor, I've got all the money, everything I want, and I'm empty. Right! Because you don't understand the eternal part of your being. And unless the eternal part of your being has been, uh, has been touched by the Lord and brought life to that part, you're empty. Pastor, this life doesn't make sense to me. Right. This life is frustrating. Right. But when you understand the purpose of this life is that there will be an eternal life, this life becomes so valuable and so precious. Well, why, Pastor? Oh, good. I was glad you asked me that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to preach the rest of the message. Because there is a place called hell and there is a place called heaven. There is a place called hell. And there is a place called heaven. I know that there are churches that you can go to and I know that there are television preachers and radio preachers and books that are written. And the modern day way to build a church is to strip away from the pulpit the preaching of hell. So you don't find very much preaching on hell. But the reality is 
hell is a real place. The reality is that Jesus himself in the Bible speaks more about hell than he does about heaven. Pastor, why would Jesus speak more about hell than he does about heaven? And since that is true, why wouldn't the preachers preach about it? Well, Jesus speaks more about hell than he does heaven because Jesus is warning people about the place called hell. Now listen, this goes back to what your pastor just said about our church. If we're going to be the pillar and ground of truth as the church is supposed to be, then we're to preach the whole counsel of the word of God. Amen? And there's a place called hell. Oh, the Bible talks about this place. The Bible says multiple things about it. The Bible says that it's a place of separation. It's a, it's a place of suffering. It's a place where the, the, of, of torment. Pastor, why, why is there a hell? Oh, I was hoping you would ask that too. Did God, did God make hell for mankind? Not really. The Bible says that hell was created for the devil and his angels. When God created mankind, God created man physically, but he also created him eternally. When God created Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were to know an eternal life and relationship with the living God. That's how man was created. But when Adam allowed sin to come in and Adam chose to sin, that sin broke that eternal life. That sin broke that relationship and death came upon mankind. And so God one day is going to separate sin from that and that's in a place called hell but that's not what God made for mankind you must understand that God does not want you to go to hell praise the Lord pastor why do people go to hell good question good question if you were to take a trip today down into hell, by the way, I don't suggest it, and you talk to the people that are there, and you said, sir, ma'am, why are you here? Here's what they wouldn't tell you. They wouldn't tell you they're there because they were drunks. Because we got some former drunks in here. Chickens. They wouldn't tell you because they were adulterers or, or because they were thieves or because they were liars. If you were to ask somebody, why are you in hell? Here's what their answer would be. I am here because I rejected the lordship of Jesus Christ in my life. And I never received the Lord. I never received his death, his burial, in his resurrection, I never believed upon him with my heart. Oh, I was a religious person. Oh, I tried to do the best I could. I thought, I thought when I died that God was going to look at me and God was going to compare me to Malcolm. And of course, I shine. Amen. Literally, I shine. And of course, he's going to choose me. But the problem is this. God doesn't compare you with any other person other than Jesus Christ. And I'm in hell today because I didn't receive the Lord. And the Bible talks about a man that was in hell and he wanted to get out. But hell is eternal. And there's no out. There's no out. There's no out. Sometimes as a pastor, I visit people and they'll say, Pastor, I hurt. I said, I understand. They said, no, the cancer's killing me. I said, I know. He said, Pastor, I'm in pain. He said, would it be okay if I just die? What do you say to somebody like that? Pastor, will it be okay if I just die? You see, sometimes this life can get so heavy that people think, well, I'll just escape this life and so I'll just die. And they think, I will no longer be tolerant of that pain in their physical body. That's true, my friend. But in hell, you can't do that. Pastor, I've lived 80 years. I've had a good life. 
This pain is killing me. I can't take it anymore. I'm just going to go ahead and die. Fine. Pastor, I've lived 500 years, and I'm in pain, and I just can't take it anymore. I'm just going to go ahead and die. Pastor, I've lived 1,000 years, and I just can't take it anymore, and I'm just going to go ahead, and I'm going to die. That's fine. But in eternity, after 100 years, it's still eternity. After 500 years, it's still eternity. After 1,000 years, it's still eternity. And there's no relent there, but hallelujah, there's no release from there either. You see, the wage of sin is death. And sin is the awful part of that that brings about death. Your life is so valuable because you were created by God. It's eternal. What you do in this life determines on your heaven and your hell. And the determination of that is what do you do with Jesus Christ? For there's all of us are sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says I was born in iniquity and my mother did conceive me. The Bible says that all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. You, 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 you can look around the world and you can see a lot of variety in men. But you can look around the world and you will not find any. Any man that can claim to be sinless, all men and women are sinners. All of us. Pastor, you mean you were a sinner at one time? Oh, Lord. If my kids weren't in here and my wife, I'd tell you about what kind of sinner I was. I'll say this. If God could save me, he can save you. Save you. What is sin? Sin's the transgression of the law. It's a rebellion against God. The only thing that cleanses us from sin is the blood of Jesus. Here's my five points. Life is short. Speaks to the value of your life. Valuable because God created you and you are eternal and eternity is long. Sin is awful. Hell's a real place, my friend. But hallelujah, heaven can be yours. I ask people sometimes, Would you like to know for sure that when you die, you go to heaven? Oh, no, pastor, nobody knows that. Let me give you a little illustration. If you know for sure when you die, you're going to heaven, would you say amen? Amen. Yes, people know that. Let's go back to the pillar and ground of truth. The Bible says this, these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. You see, heaven is not something that is a maybe when you die. Heaven is a reality now in the person of Christ. Pastor, I'm just, I'm just hoping that God will see my good deeds. You don't have any. Pastor, I, I'm just hoping that God is going to be merciful. He has been merciful. He sent Jesus. The Bible says that the only way to heaven is through the Lord. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus. Heaven can be yours, my friend, but you got to come through Jesus. You got to come through Jesus. If you don't come through Jesus by grace and by faith, then heaven's not a reality for you. Pastor, I came today because I wanted I wanted something different. I just want something different. Okay. The something different you need is the Lord. If you could just realize life is short, eternity is long, hell and heaven are real places, sin is awful, but Jesus Christ can deliver you from your sin. That's where you start, and what a start it is. Christian. I hope you're serving the Lord and doing what the Lord wants you to do. Your life is short. You only have a certain amount of time. I trust that you're obedient to what God has given to you. I trust your obedient witness. I trust you're obedient in reading the word. I trust you're obedient in serving the Lord. Your life is short. You're going to want, when you get to heaven, to have been faithful to the Lord. Let me just myth bust something, and I'm done. Only a fool who has been saved for any time at all, would say, I'm just going to be glad to be there. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. 
Because this Bible says, when you're there and you see him who died for you, you're going to want to have a life that has been serving unto him, pleasing unto him, rewarded in, from, for your service and turn around and give that reward. If you've been saved for 30 years and you're just thinking, well, I'm just going to be glad to be there, you're going to be one of those people that God's going to have to take his spiritual hanky. He's going to wipe away your eyes because you're going to regret that all you did was live your life for money or for business or for whatever else. And you never did a stinking thing for the glory of God. Our God is worthy of our service. Amen. Amen. Oh, it's going to be a great year. Let's go serve the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, simple salvation message. Just as simple. The Bible talks about the simplicity of Christ. I was preaching today for the person who's looking for meaning to life and purpose to life. I was preaching to the person who doesn't know for sure that they're going to go to heaven when they die. I wanted them to know that they can know for sure that they can go to heaven when they die, that they can know the salvation of Jesus Christ. Oh, Methuselah lived to be 969 years, but when it comes to eternity, life is short. So valuable. It's so valuable because God created them, so valuable because it's eternal, and we need to make decisions based on eternity. And the very first decision based on eternity is, what do I do with that awful sin that's in my heart? I can't get it out. I tried as a boy to get it out. I couldn't get it out. It wasn't until I came to Jesus that he washed me from my sin, saved my soul. And now, I know hell's a real place, but I'll never go there. I'll never go there. Heaven is where I'm headed because of the grace of God. I wonder today with heads bowed and eyes closed. Are you the one that God was after today? Are you the one that said, I'm coming to church today on the first Sunday of the year. Just I need something different. Well, you heard a very simple message on the someone you need and his name is the Lord. I'd ask you today. Do you know for sure if you died, if you were going to go to heaven? Are you sitting there right now assured that if you died you would go to heaven. If you are sure, praise the Lord. If you're not sure, you can know today. You can know today. You can know today. We can take a Bible. We can take three to five minutes, show you from the word of God how you can know for sure today that when you die, you could go to heaven. Your life is valuable, but it is short. Eternity is long. You must understand that. You must make decisions now in preference for that. Christian, what are you doing with your short life? Are you serving the Lord? Are you doing what God wants you to do? Maybe 2018 is the year you realize that you got to do what the Lord wants you to do. Is he speaking to you right now? Is he leading you? Is he guiding you? Oh, my friend. May God have his way. I wonder today, let's begin with the Christian. If you know for sure that heaven is your home, would you raise your hand? You've been saved. Could I see it just a second? No, nobody looking, just me. Hold it up, please. God bless you. Put it down. I want to ask this question. Pastor, I'm here today, but I don't know that for sure when I die I'm going to heaven, but I'd like to know for sure today. I'd like to get it settled today. Don't embarrass me. Don't call my name, but pray for me, Pastor. I'd like to get it settled today. Would you raise your hand? Let me see. God bless you. God bless you. I see those hands. You can put them down. You can put them down. Go ahead. Anybody else? God bless you. Pastor, I want to know for sure today. All right. So here's what we do. We always give an invitation. There's men standing here. And I would love for you to be able to come forward and tell one of the men, I'd like to know for sure that heaven's my home. We have a prayer room right here. Take you out and let talk with you about the Lord. 
Pastor, I could never come forward with all of these people here. That's just not something I can do. Well, I'll leave Brother Keith and Joy Scheffler right down here at the front. And after the service, if you want to come forward, you come forward. Let them take a Bible, show you how. Christian, are you serving the Lord? Pastor, I need to do better in 2018 than I did in 2017. Don't tell me. Come tell the Lord. Let him help you. Heavenly Father, you know our hands and you know hearts. People raise their hand that they would like to know for sure. They can. They just got to have a little courage. If they'd have a little courage just to walk down the aisle and tell one of the men they'd like to be saved, we could take a Bible and show them how to be saved. Oh, I'd love to do that. God, the Christians that know heaven for sure but aren't where they ought to be serving you, may they come, fall on their face, and do business with you. Have your way now. Have your will. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our song of invitation is page 336. I'd ask you to stand. Men of God, be here. Ladies of God, be ready to receive anybody that's coming. Stand if you would. If you raise your hand, come let us take a Bible, show you how to be saved. Christian, you lead the way now. Let God finish this in your heart. You move at his leadership. Thank you so much for your attention today, for listening, for loving the Lord, loving the Word of God. Our song to go home takes our heart and our mind to the coming of the Lord. Oh, Jesus is coming again. Brother Keith and his wife Joy are down front. If you raised your hand and you'd like to know the Lord today, they'll remain here. You come and you grab them. They'll take a Bible and show you how to be saved. I beg you, don't leave without doing that. Give us a few minutes. You could leave today knowing for sure. He's coming, class. He's coming, church. Could be today. Now listen, let's sing it right. Help me. When you get to the chorus, you see that chorus there coming again, coming again, maybe morning, maybe noon. You're not looking at it, but I'll, I'll trust you. Maybe evening, maybe soon. Uh, don't sing maybe soon. Sing surely soon. We believe he's coming soon, right? Not maybe. Sing surely there. I think you'll be blessed in doing it. God bless you. Lift your voice. Come 